Hi, and welcome back to the Shifting Schools podcast. My name is Trisha Friedman. You have caught us smack in the middle of our media and information literacy mini series. If you didn't check out the episode just before this one, I'd encourage you to do so. On today, we have a very special guest, Erin Olson, who is the Senior Manager of Education Partnerships at the News Literacy Project. We're going to get into all of the amazing free resources that the News Literacy Project provides to educators and ways that you can continue to learn with Erin and her team throughout this episode. Erin is also a former educator herself. Um, she's taught language arts, she's taught high school English, and her interest in meaningful technology integration led her to a position as a technology integrationist for a regional state education agency. Erin supports districts with tech, with literacy, with project-based learning, and STEM. She has since returned to her home district to serve as an instructional leader and instructional coach. She holds two degrees, a bachelor's in English and a master's degree in instructional and curriculum effective teaching. It's such a joy to have a member of the News Literacy Project here with us today to continue the important conversations about media and information literacy. And with that, here is Erin Olson, the second of our third episode in our Information and Media Literacy mini-series. Welcome to the show, Erin Olson. Welcome to the show, Erin. We're going to talk about your current role in a little bit, but I'd love to actually start by hitting the rewind button. Um, you are a former middle and high school teacher, and I'm wondering if we can start there, um, maybe with you sharing an anecdote with listeners about how your experience as an educator helped you understand that news literacy does have a place in every classroom. Well, I, like I said, uh, like you mentioned, I, I was a middle school and high school English teacher, and I was teaching the time when schools in Iowa were all going one-to-one. -one. And, you know, with, with access to technology, there comes a responsibility. And so I, I made sure to help my students understand um, where we could get accurate information from, you know, the various places, whether we were using uh, tools to find newspapers from across the world so we could understand perspective and, and where your place in the world influences that perspective to uh, just getting better at searching. Some of those basic um, digital and media literacy skills that were needed because, again, we had access. But, you know, I think initially where that fell short is uh, would be news literacy. And so, I think back to the skills uh, that I was teaching, and it does connect to news literacy, but specifically, I think we need to think about those critical thinking skills, understanding and, and analyzing credibility, uh, accuracy of information, and ultimately that uh, a free press leads to a better democracy, that those skills transcend classrooms. It, it wasn't um, you know, just the space of the, of the reading teacher to teach reading. We read in all classrooms. It's not just uh, in the computer science classroom where we discuss things related to computers. Every classroom accesses technology. And so, uh, you know, we think about these skills. They're necessary for our students to interact with information related to our various subjects. And also, we are all affected by mis- and disinformation, unfortunately, whether that's in history or health or insert profession, uh, mis- and disinformation, you know, it, it, it does not leave anyone out. And so, again, just as there was a responsibility in my classroom because we had access, I now see the responsibility to include news, news literacy because our students are bombarded with information in all their feeds. And that information affects their learning in all of our classrooms. It's music to my ears. 
And at the same time, I could very much imagine a listener thinking, gosh, what Aaron's saying is true. Like there is, you know, because we have information overload almost, there's also access to mis and disinformation all the time. Um, but I know that the work that you do with the News Literacy Project says, hey, don't get overwhelmed. Uh, don't, you know, give up hope. There are things that we can do systems and, uh, you know, and think about this strategically. And I'm wondering if you want to talk about that, because I think that's really important, actually, that we don't say, oh, well, I guess we can't trust anything. And I do hear folks saying that sometime, yes. and I'm thinking, no, that's not, that's definitely not the attitude that we want to take. So can you give us some advice in terms of thinking systems, thinking strategy? Uh, you know, what do we do to make sure that we are cultivating news literacy in that way? So what you mentioned about not trusting anything, that I think that's even more scary <laughs> the, the, you know, that the inability our, our, our fear of trusting anything um, that is worse. And so I, I would say that we got to get curious. Let's get curious. Let's, let's foster a healthy skepticism uh, about the information we encounter. And it is not hopeless that in fact, we are empowered. We're empowered through education. Um, the strategies that we can utilize to navigate the flood of mis and disinformation uh, are actually pretty simple. We only complicate it and we don't have to. For example, one of my favorite strategies is lateral reading. And I'm sure that's rooted in you know, my, my teaching background. But as an English teacher, I taught students to read deeply, to dig into the text, to analyze phrases, okay? But lateral reading is simple. Uh, you come across information and it, you know, triggers something, open up another tab and see if you can find it confirmed somewhere else. That's lateral reading. It, it's that simple. Um, trying to find it across the internet to see if other reputable sources have reported on said information. And if not, well, let's put it into question. And if so, okay, well, then we've confirmed what we were curious about and we're able to move on. Um, you know, I, I think too of, of, about those strategies, something that I know has, that I'm working on putting into practice, but also I think this makes me a better person and that is checking our emotions. You know, I, I mean, I'm a, I'm a nineties kid, so check yourself before you wreck yourself, right? Like you come across uh, something that angers you. Hmm. That's a sign you know, pause, there's power in the pause. We take steam out of mis and disinformation when we stop sharing it. It's pretty simple. So we are the ones that control the power. We just have to remind ourselves of that and then execute those strategies. Um, so, so we do stop the spread and, uh, and then we take ownership that just using some of those skills can, can go a long way. And that's really powerful because I think there's an interesting activity to do even with, you know, a news feed in social media where you are only presented with the headline and more and more frequently now it's sort of, you know, headlines that are tr trying to trigger a very intense mm -hmm. um, emotional response so that you click because, again, that metric is so important for them to get the clicks and just looking at those headlines inviting students to question, what are they trying to hook you with? And is it outrage? Is it fear? Is it anger? Um, and, you know, I, again, I think it's really important, as you said, like for students to be able to name it and identify it so that we're not mm -hmm. currently, you know, we're not constantly getting trapped in that sort of doom scrolling model, which I think isn't good for any of our mental health. So that's really important. And, yes, you know, Aaron, I'm thinking, Right now, of course, these skills, I think, are going to be more important than ever before because we're living and learning in an era of AI. And I know that News Literacy Project is also working to get out in front of this um, and is doing work around that and also understands like what AI is going to mean for our media uh, landscape, so to speak. So can you talk a little bit about um, you know, what, what you see as an opportunity for us to leverage news literacy, given that AI, I think, is going to um, have a huge impact in terms of the way in which we search or consume information. Would you like to talk a little mm -hmm. bit about what's going on over at uh, the News Literacy Project? Yes. So uh, I, I would say the News Literacy Project is, you know, we're responsive to 
the needs of educators and the public, but we're also proactive in planning and creating um, resources to help support this learning. And of course, AI is a hot button topic. Um, and it, we think about AI's now involvement in our digital landscape where, you know, it can produce mis and disinformation at a dizzying pace. Um, even attempting to predict what the future of AI will be, it's, you know, your guess is as good as mine. But we know that it does have influence and we know it will affect. And so let's come back to, again, the simple answer, education. That is how we navigate AI. It is with those strategies that I spoke of uh, earlier, thinking through uh, the information that comes our way. And of course, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, content that's produced and, and not knowing what's what. And, and we do need to teach students how to differentiate between information that comes into their landscape. So what is it? Is it straight news? Is it hard news? Is it opinion journalism? Because not everything is news, right? And, and so we have to consider what is this source? What's the purpose of the source? And, uh, and then we use those strategies to be able to detect if it's accurate or not, if it's mis or disinformation, is it AI generated? Uh, and that can be scary when we think about the possibilities with AI. I know that, you know, another one of our strategies is critical observation that we can use in helping detect mis and disinformation. And really that's just this intense look at whatever, you know, the, the content is, the, the image. And, and that might work for a while with AI, but I'm going to say only a short time. Like that's not enough. Um, recently I had an AI image of myself created and I had three hands. Well, you know, I imagine if I ran it through that same uh, AI generator, I'm going to have the two hands that I, you know, possess that AI gets better, right? We know AI improves that's by nature. And so we need to, uh, use those lateral reading strategies, uh, reverse image search. That's another great, uh, great strategy that we can use. So we do have resources to help, um, educators and public alike navigate the world of AI. Uh, in, in thinking on that, by the way, of a classroom, I recently just read an opinion piece written um, by a high school senior, and it was about calling for more AI in the classroom, uh, how it helped um, this student become a better student. And I thought that interesting, um, you know, and it made me think about, you know, back to when we were integrating technology initially and and acceptable use policies were uh, all over with a do not mindset, do not go here, do not do this. And, and then just as I wanted, then as I want now, I, I want technology to make us better, better people, uh, better researchers, you know, better writers. But I, I, I think we have to be cautious and curious with, with the how, um, because AI is going to get better and it has the potential to, um, help support us in that quest for better, but it also has the potential uh, to maximize uh, its ability to fabricate, plagiarize. And, and so again, the answer is education. And, and that's how we get better. That's how we use it better. That's how we are better um, through our intentional use of strategies to discern. Um, and, and again, that is empowering. Yeah, for me, that key word there is intentional. Um, you know, we at Shifting Schools, we have been working a lot with schools around this piece of how do you help students leverage it for lots of different accessibility needs, how, you mm -hmm. know, the equity piece, private tutoring has long been only within the grasp of, you know, folks that have the wealth to afford it. There's a lot that can be done with AI now that is going to give um, more students access to that kind of tutoring. And yet we never want to position this as a replacement for human connection, right? And I think the, the bias right. piece is such a great conversation to have. One of the exercises I love doing you know, is is inviting uh, ChatGPT to revise something in the voice of and then age of students you're working with. What assumptions is it actually making about your age? What's it getting right? What's it getting wrong? Um, because often that activity leads them to commenting on how, no, it's not getting 
this right. Um, and I, I think in this conversation about all of the opportunities, I think it's so important that we're never suggesting to students that this is technology is more creative than you. It is not. Right. Um, but thinking about where can it assist um, it is a really mm-hmm. great frame. And, and I think, too, you know, that that kind of connects with my next question around um, I'm seeing a lot of interesting news organizations. The New York Times just recently posted they're hiring for like an AI specific position. Um, outlets like Wired are very transparent in terms of where and when they employ AI in uh, generating stories and when and where they do not. There's a bunch of different like real estate magazines that use it. I've, I've noticed with like sports journalism, it seems increasingly popular because I could see how like with the stats and analyzing certain data, like, yes, that would be, you know, if you're kind of just doing the rundown of Mm -hmm. a game, that might work. But there's going to be plenty of situations where I don't want certain stories to be reported on solely by AI. And this is another great opportunity for us to help students understand what is the art and craft of journalism. And we've been really fortunate on this show to have, we've had graphics reporters, we've had data journalists. Um, We recently had Jen Christensen, who's at Scientific American, talking about the importance of science communication, especially in light of the pandemic. And we've approached those conversations from, you know, what are the skills that today's modern journalists needs to have and how have they cultivated them? And I, I think it's so important that we continue to step back. And if, as you and I were saying earlier, we don't want a society that is, you know, completely saying, well, I cannot trust any of the media. Mm-hmm. I think part of it is understanding, like, how does a journalist work? How do they function? Um, because, of course, there is strategy and, and process involved. And I'm, I'm wondering, um, you know, if you can talk a little bit about how the News Literacy Project is also helping to kind of demystify what the art and craft of journalism is all about? Well, part of news literacy is understanding the standards of journalism. You know, just as a former educator, I had standards to adhere to. I mean, all professions do. Journalists do as well. Um, You know, thinking about fair reporting, uh, you know, having resources and researched and relevant. And and so I, I think it's important that as we're teaching news literacy, that we ensure that we help students understand that journalists have standards of journalism that they adhere to, and they are far different than the influencer who is just posting um, on their TikTok. It's different. And that comes at understanding, you know, the zones of information, who is posting what for what purpose. And, um, and even even with that, I would say humanizing journalists, that their work is so important. It is vital. The free press is vital to our democracy and honoring that by taking time to understand that process of creation, just as you spoke to, I think is important. And even as part of, um, you know, the News Literacy Project, we have a program called Checkology. It's a free online database of lessons. And there's... Um, a newsroom to classroom program as part of that, where there's journalists from across the country who are willing to zoom into classrooms or come in person if location allows to share their areas of expertise. And I would encourage educators to take advantage of that because, you know, it. once we understand the profession, we understand the process and creation, and we also get to meet the people, I think we have a different uh, level of understanding and empathy and connection than we would have had had we not had those experiences. That's great. Uh, You know, what you said about humanizing the profession, I think like a great way to do that also, invite a local journalist into your class or have a virtual Mm -hmm. meeting with them. You know, we're also in an era where local journalism is being um, really, really underfunded. And I think getting somebody as, as local to your community as possible to come in and talk about, as you said, their standards and why they want to get their reporting for your community right and what that means to them. Um, that, that That's great advice. You know, something I really appreciate about the News Literacy Project is that it's not just educator facing, but you very much are realizing 
news literacy is, you know, we have a gap for, you know, folks that are not students on campus, but are connected to them, their parents and caretakers, their grandparents. Can you talk more about why a community centric approach is one that seems so very important to the work that your organization is doing? Mis and disinformation affects us all. So of, of course, community needs to be involved in in our quest to leverage the power of, of community to help stop the spread of mis and disinformation. It's so important. And of course, as you heard me mention, it's vital to our democracy. Uh, so, so our campaigns include partnering with community organizations and, and organizing learning geared towards different groups to help support their learning. And much as the seatbelt campaign or, you know, do not litter campaigns, you know, very similar in nature as we want to uh, leverage and connect with community to help be part of the solution because it does take us all. And one of, one of the uh, things that we have that we offer that I appreciate for community is rumor guard. Educators like that too, but it is geared towards community. And rumor guard uh, will bring up a viral rumor and then it takes it through five factors of determining whether it's legitimate, if it's accurate. And I appreciate this as a learning tool, not only as just interesting, but as a learning tool, because each rumor goes through those same uh, factors or the factors that apply to said rumor. And so that repetition, I think, helps embed um, questions we should be asking ourselves when we come across uh, a, a rumor, a viral rumor at that. <laughs> Interestingly enough, the last one that was just featured was um, it brought up the the image of a robot playing pickleball. Mm -hmm. And that is a rumor like that was not real. It was, it was a uh, doctored manipulated, um, you know, ma manipulated image. And, and so uh, I, I sincerely appreciate that as one of our many resources for community. Yeah. I, I think it's so important because, uh, uh, you know, videos like that go viral so quickly, right? Mm -hmm. um, and because we're in such an information or misinformation rich ecosystem, uh, I, I think almost what you're suggesting is get into the habit of pausing and slowing down what you are just accepting to be true, right? That that is so important. Mm -hmm. and, and again, I think in this era of AI, that's where, as you were saying, it's great to make sure that students understand what it's capable of creating. Um, you know, I, need, I used to teach a, a course with students where uh, they were learning WordPress and Divi and were making really sophisticated making websites. And part of that was for them to understand, do you see how easy it is to make something that looks really legitimate and to do it with you know, not really expensive software and to consider what this means when we have tools that can produce this. Um, and I, I feel like it's really difficult to understand it unless you have experienced the tools firsthand. And then it's, ah, now I really see the power that this has. So, you know, Aaron, I'm, I'm guessing once folks head over to the website, and again, you've mentioned um, mm -hmm. Rumor Guard, these are all accessible from uh, the News Literacy Project website. I'll be sure to mm -hmm. include that in the show notes. For folks who are listening and they're saying, okay, Erin, I hear you. I am feeling the sense of urgency to make sure that we're doing a better job with news literacy. Do you have a few suggestions for actionable steps folks can take to, you know, if they're thinking, I want to make this a priority, not months from now, but sooner than that, I'd like to bring this into my classroom. What are a few suggestions that, that they can uh, consider taking on? Well, first of all, we have Checkology um, that I mentioned earlier is our online platform for free lessons. Uh, I would encourage uh, educators to, to use that in support of teaching news literacy. But if we're just going to go to basics and think about strategy, what can I use as when I get done with this podcast? What could I, you know, what awareness can I, um, you know, heighten and can I sharpen my discernment skills? I, I would speak to thinking about misinformation, red flags and patterns. So misinformation can come in a variety of ways, but there are things that we can watch out for, uh, sharpen our defenses. Um, some of those things are when you see 
t-shirts or posters, pictures of t-shirts or posters with text on them, chances are that text was manipulated. Um, when you see uh, nature photos that are too good to be true, they probably are too good to be true and it's clickbait. Um, when you see posts that accompany taglines like make this go viral or the mainstream media doesn't want you to report this or doesn't want you to share this, you know, those alarmist kind of statements, mm, that's another flag. So if we can build our awareness of, of those flags and those, um, you know, the shapes that misinformation takes, I think that that helps build our defense. And then we can also go on the offense when we are in our feed and, and as we're navigating all that comes our way. So I, I think that, you know, those things are, are helpful. Uh, of course, I mentioned lateral reading, which is so simple. Um, in fact, even, you know, Google Bards thinks so. So that AI recently, uh, I just read now includes when you use Bard uh, and get a search query back, you know, search of information, it will have, um, you have to click a G or something, but it'll have highlighted in green information that can be found across the internet. There's our lateral read. And then in brown information that can't. Um, of course, I would rely on my lateral reading skills above all else. But but I think that's another strategy that can be used right away. And then lastly, be emotionally aware of what triggers you. I mean, mis and disinformation loves to manipulate us and that can easily be done through our emotions. We are an emotional people, um, you know, and we're angry, we want to do something and and that one can get us every time. We don't think clearly or rationally when we're you know, when we are angered. So if we just, we just got to use that power in the pause. I love that. I, I think if I could add one thing to that news literacy project also has a great podcast out called, is that a fact? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you're listening to this podcast and you probably like podcasts, I'd highly recommend checking that one out. Um, you had a recent episode about the social media influencer, which we're teaching young folks. They are, again, like surrounded by that as a culture. And a really great episode, too, on uh, mis and disinformation in the wellness and health industry, which mm -hmm. um, I was recently reading the size and scope of that industry is like much, much larger um, than I realized, like incredibly big. And I think, uh, again, a lot of mot motivation to have mis and disinformation in mm -hmm. regards to, you know, like, take this supplement and you will look this way or take that supplement and you won't get this virus or, um, and, and I think it's really important to be having that conversation about, you know, again, as you said, at the very beginning, misinformation connects to all, <laughs> you know, all aspects mm -hmm. of society. So we need to be helping students practice that critical analysis, that, that critical um, review in various different fields and not just saying, oh, well, this is, you know, the language art teacher. It's their job. Leave it mm -hmm. over there. Um, so again, I don't know if there's another episode of that podcast that you would point folks to, but um, it's, it's a great program. Highly recommend it. And we'll link to that in the show notes as well. Wonderful. No, I, I think that's really important. And I'm glad you brought up the health one. Uh, it, it is frightening how much mis and disinformation has entered that field um, and I, and I think that, you know, that touches on and it speaks to the importance of, you know, making sure that we are news literate, um, and our students are, our students are hearing from, uh, you know, the influencers that are sharing that information that are paid to share that information. And, and so speaks to the importance of critical thinking. Yes, it very, that is for sure. it very much does. Aaron, thank you so much for your time today. Uh, listeners, you'll be able to learn all about what Aaron pointed us to. Again, the, the News Literacy Project is just, it's like a treasure trove of resources and inspiration to make sure that we're embedding news literacy, not for a day or a week, but throughout the year, because it's an ongoing conversation we very much need. Thank you again so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. 